The reason why we want to make you aware of this is because as members, we want to make sure that if you're entitled to some money that you get it. Hey everybody, welcome back to Sub to Studios. Chris George here, your Sub to Chairman. Super excited today. We've got Ken Staub from Brownstown Recovery Group and the famous Craig from Cashy. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. My pleasure, Chris. Yeah, yeah thank, thank you, you very much. You know, today we're going to be talking about something that I think many of you should be aware of as merchants. As uh, there's something that's come up with Visa and MasterCard, and, and Ken's going to tell us a lot more about that. Before we even get into that, Ken, if you could, just tell us a little bit about yourself. And Craig, is you know, you too, just let us know a little bit about you. Just do a quick intro, a 30-second intro. Sure. Uh, this is Ken Stubb. I was part of the founding team at Brownstone Recovery Group. Uh, we started in 2013. My background is all financial services. I was uh, private equity, corporate banking, uh, a lot of intersections with merchant services and things along those lines for a solid 25 years. I joined a group of guys that collectively we have 30 plus years in this space. We understand class actions, we understand corporate trust, uh, the operations of banking, and we bring that experience to the table. That's great. Craig, give us a quick intro on Cashy. Sure. Craig Milius, CEO and co-founder of uh, Cashy, um, also a proud partner of Subta. Um, as you well know, we provide an intelligent payment gateway to subscription-based companies that has a software that allows them to retain uh, members through our, our recovery suite, and uh, that's what we do. Great. Thank you guys again so much for being here. And so, uh, Craig, why don't we start, or uh, Ken, I'm sorry, why don't we start, tell us a little bit more about what's happening here with Visa and MasterCard, what's happened, and why there's some money that's potentially on the table for the merchants. Sure. Uh, it's been an interesting road from that side, and, and a lot of, uh, of your members may have heard of this in different forms, and it goes hot and cold. It's gone hot and cold for the past 15 plus years. Basically what happened, and this is the second time that Visa and MasterCard has lost a class action for anti-competitive reasons. Uh, and they were fined very heavily for this. The original amount was over $7 billion. There was a lot of countersuits that came up that dragged it out, Target and uh, Walmart and Sears and all the big guys uh, countersued and wanted their own settlements. And so that basically dragged it on for all the rest of the merchants that are out there. Uh, 15 million plus eligible merchants that are in the database uh, that really ranges from January 1st, 2004 to January 1st or January 24th, really, 2019. That's the span. If you as a merchant accepted Visa and MasterCard, if you paid fees uh, in whatever form to Visa and MasterCard during that period, you're eligible to file. The interesting piece of it is that you don't have to be an active business to file for it. If you were in business from 2004 to 2010, uh, yeah. some gap in between there. If you had a bell curve company where your peak was in the you know, early teens or whatever else, uh, file. We encourage yeah. you to file. What, 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 what happened, Ken? What, ha what did Visa MasterCard do? Well, it was, bottom line, it was, they, they were accused of and it was proven that they had anti-competitive practices. The simplest way to look at it is that they had suppressed competition that was going to reduce fees, that they were going to find cheaper ways or more solid ways to provide equal or better service for a lower fee. And Visa and MasterCard basically stopped that. They, they had various ways of doing that, whether it was pricing, whether it was technology. There was a whole gamut that was proven in court that said you held back these smaller companies. You held back companies that were coming up with more innovative ways to do this and heart and soul of anti-competitive or monopolistic practices. As I said, it's the second time that they've lost this. The unfortunate piece to anticipate a question from your group is that the settlement was monetary. The settlement was basically here, take a big $7 billion hit Visa and MasterCard, which is you know not that big a number to them when you think about it in the grand scale. But short term, it didn't come back and cap fees. It didn't it forced them to change their habits. And a lot of those things are going on now. There's actually a third lawsuit that's pending out there that so, will come up later. So Visa and MasterCard weren't allowing merchants to potentially get better rates. And so then this 
suit was filed and there's this Delta that, or this, the court awarded saying any merchants that were accepting Visa and MasterCard because Visa and MasterCard didn't let you potentially get the best rates, you're entitled to some money. Is that in summary? The way that that's a very good summary. I would change one word though from the entitled side. It's really more of a recovery. If you think about it, it was an overcharge. So net, net, they couldn't, yeah, they couldn't hit them for, it's, it's almost impossible to say what was the technology value divided by 15 million of the difference between having better technology that's out there now. And you've seen the development of a lot of new players that have come up and done some very, very creative things. Uh, but they could hit them monetarily. And by hitting them monetarily, what they said was basically you got overcharged. I like to tell every one of our merchants, it's your money. It is, it is literally a recovery of your money. It's no different than if your local uh, power company charged you $20 and they were supposed to have charged you 15. Yeah. It, it literally is a recovery of your money. And how much money has been recovered already? Do you know? Uh, recovered in what, in what way you mean? Paid like, out. like for people that have filed those, because there's been a lot of money that's been given back to a lot of merchants. No. No, actually no payments have been made on that other than the ones for the large merchants that, as I said, the Targets and the Walmarts and the, and the big guys that cut separate deals. And the interesting piece was they really didn't reduce that original $7.2 billion because they didn't take a lot of money out of it. The merchants that did file and accept counterclaims and, and separate claims from that side were basically opted out of this settlement, but they took agreements or they, or they came to a settlement with Visa MasterCard that was more based on new fees, fees going right. forward, not as much cash. Right now, it's just a little bit under $6 billion that's available for payment. But, you, but that's the heart and soul of the question that really I, I like to get out to all the merchants is what is the deadline to get this filed? Have I missed it? Uh, yeah. I've heard pieces, it's come and gone. The reality of it is it dragged on because of the reasons I gave you. But in January of 2020, basically off of a decision in late 2019, the judge in the case stamped the, stamped the case as fair and adequate. And that lingo or the, the historical timelines following fair and adequate stamping or approval by the judges, it's usually 90 to 120 days afterwards that they come up with the final date for enrollment the final form and the final formula. Unfortunately for us, when this happened in January, 30 days later, the COVID and, yeah. issue came up. So right now there's not a deadline date. There is not. That's the next step. There's nothing left. There are no more arguments. There's no more administrative noise that's out there. As soon as uh, the, the group that is going to be doing the processing is allowed to gather again, I think you're going to see an announcement of a date and a final cutoff and whatever. I, I, I want to make one quick point too. That cutoff date is, is a processing date that when it hits, that's the final date that you can yeah. submit. If you're not in by that date, you're, you're in essence outside of the wall and, you, and your claim will not be accepted. It doesn't cost anything uh, to use either our services or to file it yourself. You're, you're, as a merchant, they absolutely can do it themselves. They can, yeah. go, to, so they can go to the website. These merchants that are taking pro payments every month, consumer payments over the last 15 years, um, they're, they're eligible, right, to file for this. Yeah. Is there any sort of drawback to doing this? Is it frowned upon by Visa MasterCard? Do they have to be scared that Visa MasterCard won't let them accept payments anymore? You know, what have you seen and heard? No, that's a, that's a great question because that, that's one of, we have a, a top seven issues that people say, well, I don't want to do it because of this and this and this, and I'll be happy to, to, to answer those or give you the summary. But one of them is, is there going to be payback? Is there any blowback to me my, by filing my name? And the answer is no, and not not from a, legal perspective, there's, there's really nothing that they could do from that side, but the money was set aside 15 years ago. And the interesting part of this case is as opposed to the first time Visa and MasterCard lost and to the majority of the class action suits in this country, the money at the end, if it's not claimed, cannot be sent back to Visa or MasterCard or distributed to the attorneys. The judge set this up so that there are bas there's basically a two check closeout to this. Whoever enrolls, whoever is in by the deadline, by the cutoff, is going to get processed against the numbers that they actually reflected. And that's done by, by attaching ourselves to 
accessing the Visa MasterCard database that will allow us to calculate by merchant ID number exactly what they did during that period and then file accordingly. After that, if they're, say, 20 or 30 percent of the eligible merchants are, are the total that they get on that side and they file the, the 30 percent, 30 percent equals maybe 40, 50, 60 percent of the money that's in there, the people that have properly enrolled in the first wave will then split pari passu the remaining money. Uh, we actually have, to be honest with you, Chris, we've got some merchants that we're absolutely certain are going to get larger second checks if the numbers hold the way they are now, then they will first check. Since 2014, thousands of subscription businesses have recovered over 90% of their failed recurring payments using Cashy's intelligent payment processing. That's next level service. Not only have over $100 million in funds been recovered, our clients have saved over 10,000 hours of staff time while customers enjoy uninterrupted subscription services. Catch your cash with Cashy. And so, for merchants to file for this, you know, some of that can be complicated. Tell us about what Brownstown Recovery can do for them, how they can make the process easy. Um, tell me a little bit more about that. Sure. That's the reason we got into this business is because the, the process has historically been unnecessarily complicated. It's not. Uh, in this case, it's a simple enrollment. It's basically a very short form of a power of attorney that says for this one case, and this is the only case that Brownstone is working right now. We did that deliberately. For this one case, you can act as on my behalf. You can go file. You can answer any questions that the processor has. You can do anything like that. And it's limited to that on purpose. The, all they have to provide us is the signature on that document that comes electronically. So it's done through, through an email. And then their EIN number or their tax ID number. And we will cross-reference that or work with them to get the merchant ID numbers that apply to that. Now, many, a lot of the merchants that we work with have 10 or 15 merchant ID numbers. They may have right. franchises or they may have gone in and out of certain types of corporations. Maybe they yeah. were an LLC and they changed to something else. None of that matters. We, we, get, we collect that data. We're empowered by that one signature and by the, by, the, by the information that they give us there, and that's it. We don't need data from the merchant. And that's one of the biggest things, Chris, that when this first came out, there were a number of companies that were requiring statements to be sent and to be hand calculated and things like that. And the judge basically eliminated them from participating in this because that's not necessary. Right. We, we have the algorithms and the, and the background to be able to calculate it for them and let them focus on whatever their focus is. They can make pizzas or run their restaurants or-, or Do you have a sense for somebody that does, I don't know, two, three, five, ten million in revenue, what they might be looking at, at in terms of a recovery amount? Yeah, the, the slippery slope part of answering that is that the final formula hasn't been published. And I'll give you an example of, of why at Brownstone, we say, yeah, we can work with each individual and say, let's figure out ballpark, how many years you've been in, in the business, yep. what you think your average Visa MasterCard payments were for, for those periods and, and what your recent numbers are. And what we do is we can calculate then for the individual merchant and say, we think you're going to be between this and this. Uh, we think it's illogical for us to be in this business and not be able to tell them what they should anticipate. We like to use the analogy, look, we're gonna tell you the stadium and the section and the rows and the right. seats, somewhere between seat yeah. X and, and, and seat YY. And, and that, we like to make the merchants comfortable with that because then you say, listen, first of all, it doesn't cost you any money to file. You don't have to share any data, so you have no exposure and there's no, no one competitively can do anything with this. Um, and even if you have a different background, if you were in and out of the business, if you, if you filed for just three years instead of the full 15, it doesn't matter. It's found money. And from the processing perspective, we like to give them a ballpark. Like I said, what, somewhere in this range of seats, this is what you're going to be looking at. Someone that's, you know, looking at four or five million dollars just to, you know, to throw it out there is easily looking at several thousand dollars minimum recovery from that side. And again, you, you do with it what you want. It is found money from that perspective. Yeah. And Craig, you've got some customers that have 
have done this and went through Brownstown? Oh, yeah, quite a few, Chris. <clears throat> We've got, uh, in fact, I was just tallying it up on a monthly basis, probably somewhere in the ballpark of about 15 million of enrolled right now on a monthly Great. basis. Yeah. And they're excited, right? Because it's potentially found money that they should have, they're, you know, that they should have gotten or, or they were overcharged, right? Oh, yeah. So, totally. And how do they say the process was in terms of working with Brownstown? Extremely easy, simple. Okay. Good, good. And uh, Ken, what's it cost the merchant? We, we actually set our fees based on the merchant size. Um, not on complexity, not on how much we have to do. Everyone gets treated the same. So if ultimately at the end of the day, the courts come back and they ask us for lots of different variables or whatever else beyond what we've collected in that first uh, enrollment phase, it doesn't matter. Brownstone's prepared. This is, this again, is the only product that we're putting out there now. We, we to be very honest with you, we're creating a brand name. Uh, there may be opportunities later to do other things, but we're not cross-selling anything or anything beyond giving them exceptional service. So when we say that, you know, on the fee side of it, if someone is doing 15 million a year, they're going to be in a different fee category than someone that may be doing 200,000 yeah. or 500,000. But I say that, and again, keeping with that, that whole stadium and seating analogy that I used a little while ago, um, we are not the cheapest by, by a long measure. There are people out there that will give you very cheap service for very cheap fees. And there are people that charge an egregious amount. We do a constant study and are always well below the midpoint. Yeah. Uh, it usually comes down to, uh, depending on, again, on size, a percentage of the final payment somewhere between 20, 25%. Uh, if they're very large, we can go lower than that if, if it's in both parties' best interest. Uh, I will tell you this much. We have yet to have a complaint about the fees. And so, and they don't pay any fees unless you recover something. None. Zero. We, we, we did no, that on purpose. No too. risk to the merchant. It's almost like a no brainer, right? There's no risk to the merchant. Now. Um, only, the only risk I would argue that they have out there is, is, and this is not being ne too negative to the competition, but check out the people that they're working with because yeah they could ask them for some things they could, they could do things or they could make a big promise that here's what it is. And we're going to be, you know, cheaper than the brownstones of the world. And again, we're one of the larger players, but we're going to be cheaper. Um, and then they disappear. That has happened. That had happened the last time. Uh, make sure that the people that they're working with are qualified from that side. Other than that, you said it very well. There's no risk to it. Got the it. only risk is doing nothing. And they could potentially follow this themselves. Right. But they're just, What's that process look like? Yeah, you can go to, uh, there's a website, it's published, we, we, we publish it on our website and we put it out there. It's part of the disclosure part that you can do this yourself. You can go in and ask for a form, uh, go to the website now, it's the official court website um, that we can publish. We can, I can, I can send that out for you guys uh, and just take a look at how they process it. There's going to be a 1-800 line that when they do pull the trigger and say, okay, now you've got so many days to file this, we're, we're here to give you help. The analogy I, I use there, Chris, is I've tried that with the IRS before also. And they're not really designed to help yeah. from that perspective. You guys have done thousands of these or hundreds of these. And you just yes. Our, our, our operations group yeah. is. So in summary, uh, you guys, those listening as merchants, you've been overcharged. Brownstown can help you recover. You're entitled to some of that. Brownstown can help you recover it. They make the process very easy. They don't charge you unless they collect something, you know, and, and for us as Subta, the reason why we want to make you aware of this is because as members, we want to make sure that if you're entitled to some money that you get it right. And uh, Craig brought Brownstown to us uh, to say, Hey, your members are entitled to some of this money. We should make them aware of that so they can recover it. So I think that's great. I think it's really great. And I think that um, it makes sense for merchants to really be thinking about doing this. They, it sounds like they can just sign a power of attorney and hand it off to you and they can just continue on with their day and work. And uh, what might it look like though? How long do you think until they might see a check? I don't, I, I, if I knew that answer, I tell you what, I, 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 I would share with you guys in a heartbeat, but yeah. the reality of it is again, we were up against, you know, the, the court's pulling the trigger in January. She, the, the, the judge had said, let's get this done. It's over. And, and she's the replacement judge, by the way. The original judge 
um, w w oversaw the 15 years, the new judge came in and said, enough, let's get it, let's get it paid. I consider a lot of her rulings so far to be very pro-merchant. Um, if, if, if the indications we have from all the other cases we've done held up with this one, it would have been 90 days or so. We would have seen a formula and a form. Our processing is very fast, very, very quick from that perspective. One thing I do want to emphasize too, we do all the communications with the merchants. So once they sign up, it's not just a cold handoff. We will give them updates and tell them what's going on with this. The second the court publishes the, the, the final form and the formula, we will send an email directly to the contacts for e at each merchant and then show them what the processed amount is, show what the, what the actual court appointed processor comes back with and say, do you want it or, or not? Yeah. If we think it's low for their industry, for what they did, for the numbers they shared with us, we'll go back and argue it. And it. Uh, that's the biggest thing. And, and frankly, you gave me a great opportunity a second ago and I missed that. It, you, are, you can file it yourself, but understand if you file it yourself and you make a mistake, the processor can reject that form back to you and not, it. And not yeah. show you where the error is. Yeah, makes sense. Listen, I think this is super advantageous. I think those listening uh, should, should really consider this. And, you know, is there anything you want to add to what we've talked about, Craig or Ken? You know, to me, this is sort of a no-brainer and, and it's, it's pretty easy. It's just, hey, get involved. They can reach out to you. But anything lastly here you want to add to this? I'll add, yeah. the, you know, when Ken approached us and said, hey, there's an opportunity here for all of your merchants to capitalize on this. We actually indulged in a lot of research on not only Brownstone about this class action lawsuit. And again, Ken pointed out, if you go to the link and you look at everything, all the forms and all the reading, it's very intimidating when, when, yeah. if you think you're going to take that on yourself. So... <clears throat> With the research we did, and the reason we chose Brownstone as a partner on this was a lot to do with the, the ease, simplicity, but also their expertise in this field in the past. They, they know what's going on, and it's evident. So I, I'll, I'll leave it with that. I appreciate it. Chris, I, I, learned a long, I learned a long time ago, if someone pays you a compliment at that level, or if you feel like you're in a, in a really good spot, stop talking. So uh, I don't, I don't have anything else to add. You've asked great questions and I appreciate it. Ken, how can they get a hold of you if they want to learn more? Uh, they can go to our website, which is www.brownstonerecovery.com and do some, they can do quick reading. We, we actually wrote that from a merchant's perspective. The entire website's very clean. My email and my connection points are on there as well. We'll uh, put a link in the, we'll put a link on the uh, YouTube uh, channel too, for people to check out that'd, so that'd be great we have we have the full customer service backing too so someone will get in touch with them very quickly but uh, it, hey. it's not so hard for us to do the follow-up on this it yeah. really is very rewarding for us to connect with those merchants hey guys i love it thank you again for being on craig as always thank you for your support kind of look forward to talking to you guys soon and if you need anything please feel free to reach out thank you guys thank you. bye now